Hey Don, you're, if you're on the line, your slides are all loaded up, you're ready to go. Great, thank you. Um, sorry I couldn't be with you today. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm trying to see which slide we're on by watching the streaming video, so there's a little delay. Um, so I'm going to follow on Chuck's talk a little bit about models. Uh, but first, I wanted to make a couple of comments on uh, some of the skin microbiome work uh, that was presented earlier and, and some interesting features that we've noticed related to occupation and microbiome, dermal and respiratory microbiome. If I get the next slide. We found that um, we, we did a, a, a small study uh, about 10 subjects who worked in uh, animal labs with ferrets and controls from the same campus and looked at uh, their dermal microbiome and anterior nasal swab microbiome and looked at the microbiome of the ferrets by swabbing uh, a couple of locations on the ferrets. And one of the interesting things to come out of this was that the uh, ferrets um, microbiome was quite distinct, of course, from the humans. Uh, and, uh, but but the, the lab workers' microbiome and the controls from the same campus had quite different microbiomes as well. And that the lab workers don't seem to have picked up a microbiome from the ferrets. They just seem to have a more diverse and different microbiome than the people who don't work in labs where they have ferret exposure. Next slide. And when we analyze this, trying to uh, find the differences that might be predictive, we were able to see that there were uh, a set of about 163 uh, OTUs that clearly differentiated uh, people who worked with ferrets from those who didn't, uh, and that there was a, those that were positively associated with the ferret uh, workers were negatively associated with the controls and vice versa. And uh, so we were within this test sample, and we're still waiting to get data from the, the trial sample, uh, able to accurately predict 100% of the time who worked in a lab. And the fact that we didn't see shared microbiome between the lab workers and the ferrets uh, raises the question whether maybe the work environment is creating selective pressures among those bacteria that survive well on the skin and in the anterior nose uh, that shifts the microbiome, uh, but it isn't necessarily that the microbiome is coming from someplace else, but rather it's better competing with what's around. And I just want to throw that idea out there as a, another way to think about what's going on. And this was done with the... Uh, uh, B1, uh, B3, the standard uh, microbiome protocols at the Institute for Genome Sciences in Baltimore. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. The next slide, please. So we've heard that uh, about some risk assessment, and there's a number of models out there. Uh, that have tried to deal with exposure in the indoor environment and risk assessment. But one of the problems with the models is often that because we're talking about uh, very low doses and um, uh, or we're talking very generally about contact without specifying what contact is in many infectious disease models, uh, it's hard to know how a specific um, uh, intervention might make a difference. And 
we've been trying in, in, in my group for some years now to uh, look at, well, what is the source of infectious aerosols or res for respiratory viruses coming from people? How do they generate aerosols? And uh, what's, what, how do we characterize these aerosols? And what are factors that seem to drive that? So as part of this effort, we developed uh, the, the G2, uh, affectionately known as the Gesundheit machine for reasons I won't go into today. But in fact, um, as I will tell you in a few minutes, sneezing isn't actually a major part of what we're looking at. The key thing here was that we needed an instrument where people uh, were not breathing into a tube, such as you saw this morning uh, uh, Lindley's paper, and he's done some really nice work looking at cough aerosols, but the person has to cough into a tube. Uh, similarly, there's been a, a, a lot of really productive work in TB, again, with somebody coughing into a tube and then collecting in some sort of device and sampling from that into a standard bioaerosol sampler. We wanted to have people breathing unrestricted so that we could look at things like whether putting a surgical mask on them makes a difference. So uh, this device was developed so the person could sit in the lab stool with their head into what's basically a local exhaust hood, um, pulling the air from around them and collecting it for uh, analysis. Next slide. And uh, we more recently applied this in uh, a study on the University of Maryland campus uh, where we um, asked people just to sit in the booth for half an hour after uh, they presented with influenza-like illness uh, and meeting certain criteria, uh, including either we observed the fever or they had a positive rapid test so that we knew we were working with likely influenza cases. And um, they recited an alphabet at intervals during the 30-minute sample. We counted uh, audible spontaneous coughs and sneezes uh, and collected the coarse particles by impaction uh, a, uh, on a dry substrate and collected the fine particles uh, in liquid with a buffer to preserve infectiousness. Next slide. And what you see here is that we screened 377 cases, um, uh, episodes, uh, and um, 355 significant different episodes from, from people who presented some of them multiple times, uh, and enrolled 178 subjects. Uh, 120 of them had positive rapid tests, 58 had fever and a cough, but a negative rapid test, and collected 278 uh, half-hour samples. It turned out that 254 of these half-hour samples were on people who were PCR positive for influenza. And on the right, you see a uh, box plot of the number of copies of um, uh, of RNA, a virus, a viral RNA from the M protein uh, that we saw in the nasopharyngeal swab, in the coarse aerosol, and in the fine aerosol from these subjects. Uh, and so you can see that um, the median fine aerosol contains something like 10 to the fourth, uh, 10 to the third RNA copies. Um, the coarse aerosol uh, had fewer, and actually the median case had none. Uh, and this is similar to previous reported results using this instrument, that their uh, tendency to produce more fine aerosol. But now we want to know what's driving that. In the next slide, uh, we look at the effect of sneeze and cough on this aerosol. So the nothing, no nothing group are people who didn't sneeze or didn't cough. Uh, any sneeze 
as a small group of a, 11 samples where somebody sneezed at least once, and the any cough uh, but no sneeze is everybody else. So the vast majority of the specimens fell into the no coughing or the any cough. Most subjects did cough some. And you can see that sneezing really had uh, essentially no impact on uh, compared with cough. Um, and, and so it, it really, and, and that there's people who didn't cough and didn't sneeze who had up to a million copies of uh, viral RNA in their exhaled breath. So that uh, even coughing uh, is not the sine qua non of infectiousness for influenza aerosols. Next slide. So focusing in on cough, uh, again, people with no cough, people with less than or equal to one cough per minute over 30 minutes, and people who cough more than one here you begin to see an effect that as there's more cough, there is more viral production. But again, it's not, um, it's not as if people who didn't cough at all didn't produce some viruses. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'm not going to show you the data today, but uh, we were able to culture virus um, from these aerosol samples, uh, as well as measure it by PCR. And uh, we found the culturable uh, virus in the exhaled breath from people who did not cough at all for 30 minutes. So shedding of viral, uh, uh, infectious viral particles is not driven just by cough. So um, while there's, you know, wonderful uh, work going on about the dynamics of uh, aerosols and sneeze and cough and the breaking up of the fluid films and so forth, um, that's not the whole story. Uh, and, and, the, and the sneeze part, which is a little easier to study because you can get people to sneeze, is uh, with pepper and so forth, is, is, um, is not going to answer the whole question of what's happening with these aerosols and how they're behaving. Next slide. One of Wells' early insights was this idea of this, that, that infection was appeared to be playing a Poisson relationship to dose. And we've heard a little bit of, about how uh, there are alternative ways to model this uh, and, and that uh, there may be other effects. Um, but one of the things that, that we would be thinking about today is, so what are the factors that drive this variation in susceptibility, because when we look at it at an individual level, this model probably works, but when you look at a big population level, you have such a variation in what is the quantity that it takes to initiate infection in, say, elderly individuals versus young people, that, uh, that, that a simple Poisson model uh, becomes uh, uh, difficult to apply. However, it has, for some infections, such as tuberculosis, been a very useful model uh, in describing the risk in, in built environments. And the next slide. Riley uh, developed this model uh, many years ago, uh, building on very simple uh, Poisson models of infection. But what he was trying to do was to then incorporate the room ventilation rate uh, into the equation, as well as thinking about 
uh, this source strength, uh, which was the rate at which the source in the building was generating infectious doses. Next slide. The problem in many applications of this, however, is that it is making a lot of assumptions about steady state, how rapidly do you get to the steady state, do you maintain that steady state, and ventilation measurements, as the people from the building science side of the room will tell us, ventilation is hard to measure because it's not necessarily just what you're trying to put into the building, but what's leaking in and out of the building as well. Um, so next slide. One approach to this is to use some kind of a marker like uh, carbon dioxide. This is, I'm sorry, I've forgotten I put these slides in here that they uh, uh, work that Riley did to get to this equation was to look very detailed way at the distribution of infection in the academic curve within a school building. Next slide. And take into account the ventilation and which bus kids rode on and how much ventilation was there likely to be in the bus and so forth to uh, model this outbreak. And, and uh, uh, it was an outbreak of, um, of measles. Next slide. And it's been adapted in various ways, um, but uh, and, and used uh, to understand TB, out, TB outbreaks in particular, uh, but uh, hasn't seen much broad use beyond that because of the problem of how do you take uh, some kind of measurement of uh, say how many RNA copies are in the air and translate that into an estimate of risk. Next slide. It also has the problem of making those steady state assumptions and uh, Steve Rudnick and I worked on a approach to dealing with that that used the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the building. And unfortunately, the F-bar equation doesn't seem to show up here, but the uh, F-bar is the fraction of the air in uh, the occupied space that is exhaled breath based on comparison of indoor and outdoor CO2 concentration and the concentration of CO2 in exhale breath, which is fairly constant. This still makes the assumption that we have a well-mixed environment. Next slide. Uh, it's been criticized because this quantum is a theoretical construct, not a measurable quantity. Uh, one can break it down to look at what of it is measurable and incorporate uh, features such as the probability of deposition uh, and particle size and the number of organisms per particle and so forth. And when one does that, you end up with another way of getting back to the more complex versions that uh, Dr. Haas was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, so that, that's helpful. The non-steady state versions still assume this well-mixed environment, and that has been criticized by some building science people uh, who point out that many buildings are not well-mixed and that if you have a source in one location, uh, you may have very uneven distribution such that some of the other occupants get most of the exposure, others get very little. But when you try to model those sort of things, 
what often ends up is with models that assume that the source stays in one place and that the recipient stays in one place and doesn't account for the fact that people move around. And I would argue that once you start incorporating the fact that people move around, you end up with something that looks a lot like, in terms of exposure, a well-mixed environment. And that may be why there's been such great success modeling exposures with Wells-Riley equation. Next slide. So there are a number of uh, newer approaches to trying to model uh, infectious disease that have been focusing on uh, the, the standard infectious disease models where in you look at uh, contact as a black box, uh, but then elaborating on them by looking at social networks and contacts and looking at genetics. And uh, IPMA and uh, Bowles and others have done some really nice work in the last few years trying to get at what do you see when you look at social networks? What do you see when you look at genetic networks? And how do you merge the data from these two sets of things? If you do deep sequencing of the virus isolates from uh, or, or even whole genome uh, uh, sequencing directly from samples without having inter any intervening culture, what is the map you get of relatedness? And how does that map onto the relatedness that you see uh, and, and, and trains of infection that you would uh, predict based from the social network modeling. Uh, and some of the interesting things that have come out of this, for example, with influenza find that children who sit next to each other in school don't have particularly high relatedness of their infection. It's just being in the same class or of the same gender. The boys share infection with boys, girls share, share infection, infection with girls in elementary school, and classrooms share infection, but that uh, the social networks themselves don't seem to be particularly predictive. Um, and one can then speculate what does that mean about the mechanism of transmission. Uh, okay. I that the last slide? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Don. Thank you.